everyone, I have great news. We just solved privacy. Hell yeah. In fact, I don't even know why we need this conference anymore. All we need to do is to take our data, put it through a synthetic data generator, and ta-da! We get something that we can use for all of these pesky data sharing or publication use cases. You know, the ones where your lawyer said you have to anonymize your data and we didn't really know how to do this? Well, anonymization is hard, but synthetic data is really easy. All you need to do is, you know, use any vendor system, press a button, and bam, you're done. Now, if you're like me, you don't take claims like those at face value, right? A natural question you might ask is, why does this stuff, synthetic data generation, actually preserve privacy? All of these marketing claims, how are they justified? In some cases, the answer is, eh, you, you know, it's synthetic. It's fake data. That means it's safe. Stop, stop asking questions. Now, you're all privacy professionals, so I trust that if somebody gives you this kind of you know, hand-wavy, non-answer, you're going to be able to smell the bullshit from a distance. Sometimes, though, the answer seems to make a lot more sense. That answer is, we know it's safe because we can measure how safe it is. We can generate some data, run some calculations, and the calculations, the metric, it tells you whether the data you generated is too risky or whether you're good to go. You're good to go. That sounds pretty great, right? Hi, I'm Damien, and today I'm really excited to tell you about empirical privacy metrics. The first question you probably have is, how do they work? When, when synthetic data vendors give you a, a risk measure, what does that thing actually measure? In this talk, I'm going to focus on one kind of metric, which is both the most reasonable sounding and also the most widely used. This is a family of metric called similarity-based metrics. The idea is relatively simple. First, you take your data and you split it in two parts, the trained data and the test data, kind of like what you do in machine learning. Then, you use only the trained data to generate your synthetic data. Then, and this is where it gets interesting, you compute the distance between the synthetic data and the trained data. There are many ways to compute the distance between two distributions, but uh, here, you know, you're going to end up with different metrics depending on the distance you choose. But this is not really important, so I'm just going to, you know, uh, skim this and say this is a measure of how similar the distributions are to each other. Then, you compute a second distance, this time between the synthetic data and the test data. This gives you two numbers in total, so you do the natural thing and you compare the two numbers with each other. Is the distance to the trained data smaller than the distance with the test data? If yes, that's... Is that good or bad? bad? That's bad, correct. That means you generated records that are close not just to the distribution of the data, but to the specific points that we use for generation. That could be a sign that we leaked some private information. It's very similar to machine learning overfitting. Conversely, so that's bad. And conversely, if the two numbers are roughly the same, or even if the distance to the trained data is larger, that means we're fine. We didn't leak any sensitive data. Right? I mean, that does sound reasonable, right? But I did say something about bad and ugly before, so you can probably see where this is going. So let's get into it. What's bad about those? First, a main problem is that it's really easy to cheat at these metrics. All we need to do is make sure that the synthetic data isn't too close to the training data. Except if we do this, of course, we do leak information, exactly what's happening in this screenshot, in this screenshot of some COVID-19 tracking app here. Knowing where the real data is not gives us, gives us information about what, where the real data points actually are. You could tell me that's not a real problem. Damien, we're not actually cheating in real life. We're not doing this in practice. Except you're using machine learning algorithm. You're, you're giving your data to a neural network. You don't fully really understand how it works behind the scenes, but you go tell it, go optimize for two metrics. Here's how privacy is defined. Here's how utility is defined. You know, go achieve both objectives. Guess what? Neural networks are going to cheat. That's what they'll do. They're just going to do this in a way that's slightly less obvious than if you do it by hand. Second, the process I described earlier has some inherently random aspects to it, like which data are you using for training versus testing? Or what's the random seed you use for machine learning training? So what happens if you change those? Does your empirical privacy metric 
return the same result? Is it robust? It turns out that researchers tried this, and there's shocking levels of randomness there. So in, in many vendor products, um, the metrics sometimes tell you that everything looks good, and then you rerun the exact same algorithm and the exact same data, and all of a sudden it tells you that it's very bad. So that does not exactly inspire confidence. OK, there's worse. I count at least two much more profound issues. One is that these similarity-based metrics assume an attacker who's trying to do something really weird. They have synthetic data points on one hand, they have real data points somehow on the other hand, which is kind of weird, and their goal is to link the two together. If they can accurately draw some of these lines, then they win. But that's not what attackers do in real life. There can be leakage even if no such line even exists. Attackers can do things like reconstruction attacks, explode the details of your algorithm, use auxiliary information. Sometimes they can even influence your data. The distances we saw earlier, they don't model any of that. Finally, remember how we were computing the distance between distributions earlier? The single number gave us an average metric about our system. So at best, it tells us how well we're protecting the average data point in the data set. But, and I can't stress this enough, everyone needs privacy guarantees, including outliers, especially outliers. If, if you have an algorithm that you know, leaks the data of everybody, I would argue it's better than one that just leaks the data of outliers. At least you would notice and fix it. So these four problems I talked about are pretty serious. Suppose we somehow fix all of those. Does that mean we're good? I don't think so. The design of these empirical metrics is bad, but the way they're used is much more problematic. Fundamentally, what are they trying to do? They're trying to quantify risk. They tell you there's some kind of risk scale. Some end of the scale is great here. Some, some end is bad. Well, we've seen that we're not exactly measuring risk, more like risk. But more importantly, the people building and selling synthetic data technology are telling you you can generate some data and know where you are on the scale. Like, for example, there, you're in the safe zone, you're fine. But that's not what empirical privacy metrics can ever tell you, even if you fix all the problems I mentioned before. At most, they can tell you something like, you're somewhere here. <laughs> we know for sure that you're not on the left of this. Maybe we run an attack, and we found this is the success rate of the attack. So we know it's at least that bad, but we don't know how much worse this can get. Maybe a better attack would have a much better success rate. We don't know. I want you, to all, I want you all to keep this framing in mind where, when people are selling you privacy tech and presenting empirical metrics as a solution to your concerns. They will, I guarantee it, I have read all their marketing, present it as a thing that can allow you to verify that your data is safe. This is a lie, and the sad thing is, I don't even think the people, realize, the people repeating this lie realize that the framing is dishonest. You got a number, you know, on a scale that's labeled risk, you just really want to believe in it. Which, by the way, leads me to my last point. I promised you bad and ugly, and I showed you bad, worse, and worst. Where's the ugly? Let me ask you a question. Why is the state of empirical privacy metrics in the synthetic data generation so bad? Why do people use such garbage metrics and make such outlandish disclaims? I don't believe in bad people. Whenever something, broke, something is broken, my first question is, what are the incentives at play here? So let's think about it. Why would synthetic data vendors want to improve their metrics? Why would structurally motivate them to do better? Let's make a pros and cons list. Starting with, what do they not do that? Obviously, this is more work. We have metrics today, so if we need to change them, that's you know, annoying. If we make metrics better, they might find privacy issues, which is not great because we sold a whole lot of that stuff being safe. Also, making stricter metrics is also going to make it harder for us to design synthetic data generation in the future. Plus, this idea that you can generate data that's privacy safe, that you don't have to worry about compliance anymore, that's a major selling point. So if we start poking holes in that story, it becomes harder to sell. Finally, by and at large, People don't really understand this anonymization thing. Synthetic data seems to make sense, and the idea of measuring privacy is definitely reasonable. OK, so those are the reasons why vendors would not spontaneously be incentivized to make things better. What are the pros, though? Why would they do that? 
No, no, seriously, I'm asking. <laughs> Why would they? From where I'm standing, there's really not much pushing folks to do better. Adopting a truly adversarial mindset is hard. This stuff is complicated. The metric seems to make sense. So why do we change any of it? One possible reason is because you, as buyers of the technology, as privacy professionals, maybe as standard bodies and as regulators, are asking for it. <laughs> My one call to action for you is please start doing so. The people in your data deserve it. Now, is there a path to redeem these empirical privacy metrics? Can we ever get good answers to the question we ask to synthetic data vendors? Believe it or not, I actually think so. First, quantifying risk is a great idea. Having a goal with a number attached to it is a great motivator. We can track progress, we can quantify trade-offs, and empirical, estimating empirical risk is also a great idea. We should absolutely run attacks on our privacy-critical systems and measure their success. I want to know where I land on that scale, so how can we do that in a better way? First, we need better metrics. We need to measure something meaningful. Otherwise, I refer you to Leah's excellent talk last year. If you have bad metrics, you're going to make very bad decisions. The attacker model needs, needs to make sense. It shouldn't be too easy to cheat. It should capture the risk for the least protected people, and so on. There are some recent papers that propose new, better ideas on how to quantify privacy risk empirically. We're far from having a definite answer there, but you know, maybe there's hope. Second, we need to frame these metrics better. We need to accept that they're only giving us part of the story. These metrics could be great. The, the way these metrics could be great at is telling you, hey, there's a problem here. We just showed that the risk is high, like, like an alert, a warning sign. The absence of alerts does not mean everything is fine. But whining signs are still super useful. Third, we need to use empirical privacy metrics in conjunction with other ways of quantifying risk that give provable worst case guarantees. Of course, in a complete shock to everybody who knows me, I'm talking about default for privacy here. But I'm not saying it's the only answer. Sometimes, quite often, actually, even, even more in the context of synthetic data, you need large privacy budgets to get good utility with default for privacy. So relying on the mathematical guarantee alone can feel, can feel a little iffy. Complementing that with empirical analysis makes a lot of sense and can provide a much you know, com more complete picture of the risk. That last part is important because this is the only way I know to actually make incentives align a little better. Again, you know, vendors have no incentive to improve metrics and being more honest in marketing unless you start asking for it. So I hope you'll call them out on it. That might change the balance a little bit, but still. By contrast, when you quantify worst case risk, then these, incenti these incentives become much more aligned. When you do more work, it leads to better privacy utility trade-offs. It structurally tends to keep you honest. You have to quantify everything. Also, one more reason why we like default for privacy. If you want to hear more about this last thing, come talk to my colleagues and I at Tamil Labs. We help organizations safely share our published data using default for privacy. On the right, you can have some links to social media and to my blog post series about it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>